I want to share with you today good news of the gospel. You know, God talks to me in strange ways at times. Sometimes he'll, he'll drop a thought into my heart that it's so soft that if I wasn't paying attention, I could miss it. Uh, I find sometimes that he speaks to me uh, when I first wake up, I'll hear uh, a thought or an idea that he speaks to my heart. It's like before I, my mind is engaged and being all busy for the day, that he'll drop something in there. Or sometimes it's when I'm in the shower, just unexpected times that he will he will drop th thoughts in my heart. And so then I, as I like, did I really hear that? Let me think about that. And it, it gives me an opportunity to meditate on what he said and ponder it. And a few weeks ago, he spoke to my heart and said, I am not my savior. I am not my savior. Now that seems like a strange thing. We're we all know that. We know that we're not our Savior. But yet sometimes we act like our salvation is totally dependent upon what we do. And we miss the whole mark of what Christ has done for us. Christ has done awesome things. And we need to keep the focus on what Christ has done for us and accomplished for us. It is humbling. It is mind-boggling when we concentrate and meditate and know what Jesus Christ has done for us. And the more that it that that is revealed, the more that is expanded in my spirit, it's just overwhelming to know what Christ did for me. But what a relief to know I am not my savior. Repentance and confession are two things that are definitely connected with religious activities. Um, repentance is an action, an activity. My dad used to say that the steering wheel was the repenter on a car because it could help you and cause you to change direction. Repentance is changing direction. It is not uh, just uh, lip service, but repentance is actually a change. Whereas confession is with our lips and with our mouth. And they are definitely part of our salvation, but they are not the totality of our salvation. The totality of our salvation is believing in Jesus Christ and receiving what he has done for us and applying it to our lives. However, so many times people get caught up with much repenting and much confessing, but we can see that in many, many, many religions of the world and that and in it in and of itself does not save you because people are repenting all the time. People are confessing all the time. We're coming up on the uh, on a new year. And so we're gonna have a lot of people that are gonna be making new year's resolutions because they're trying to change. They're trying to do it by their willpower. And yet Christ comes to change us, to bring changes within us and in our lives. And so therefore in Romans uh, 1 16, it says that the gospel is uh, the power of God to salvation. The gospel is power. How many times they, oh, I'm not going to do this anymore. And you make up your mind. And that's the very thing that you do. And you're you continually fail because you're trying to do it on your own. You're not doing it with the power of God, but the gospel, the story of Jesus Christ, the news of Jesus Christ is the power of God to salvation that causes these changes to work into our life. So we have many people of many religions who repent and confess and do all kinds of works. Even Martin Luther was walking up and down stairs on his knees trying to earn his salvation when the revelation came to him that the just shall live by faith. It was not by his suffering. It was not by him doing those things, but it was him receiving what Jesus Christ, by faith we receive what he has done for us and apply it to our lives. So even when the enemy comes to us and tries to say, oh, look what you did, you were horrible, and look at that, and points out things, we go, you know what? By the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is covered. I may have been that, but I no longer am that. And you cannot put that on me because we receive what Jesus Christ has done for us. 
How are we saved? Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, not your sins, but you confess the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. I am saved because I believe who Jesus is and I receive what he has already done for me. He paid the price. He was judged for me. He got what I should get so that I could have what he should have or should have received. He was faithful to going to the cross to bring to you and me salvation that we would not be judged. Because see, since God judged Jesus Christ in those things, when we're under the blood, God cannot judge us again because if he does, that's double jeopardy. It's, the price has already been paid. I heard someone given a great story that they were, uh, they had read a story about a couple of guys that were out hunting in the brush and they started hearing this noise and they, uh, they realized a brush fire was coming and there was nowhere for them to run. And so one of the hunters got out um, a lighter or something that started a fire and he burnt the circle that they were standing in. I'm sure it was further out. He burnt it all over. And, when, and then they hunkered down in the middle of the circle and when the fire, the brush fire came, it went all around them and continued on and they got out safely because it could not burn again what had already been burned. And that is the same thing with Jesus Christ. He has been judged for sin. And when we're in him, when we're covered by the blood, God cannot judge us again because it's already been judged. The gospel is good news indeed. Um, if you are paying the price for some sin that you've done in your life, if you think, uh, I deserve to be sick because I married the wrong one, I deserve to be poor because I got pregnant out of wedlock, I deserve to be poor because I had an affair, and I go through all these things, then I am trying to pay the price. I can't really believe that I'm forgiven if I'm trying to pay the price. This is where it's extremely humbling because there's nothing I can do to deserve salvation. I can't deserve it. All I can do is receive what he has done. It is mind boggling. It's, I, I continue to say it's overwhelming because it, it is. And my, my words falter or, or don't measure up to even describe what a wonderful gift this is. But to know there's nothing I can do to deserve it, but Jesus took the penalty is just amazing. But you see, in, in the Old Testament, it was a lot of do bad, get bad, do good, get good. And so it's kind of like karma, which karma is actually out of Hinduism and Buddhism. And a def definition of karma in yourdictionary.com is, the destiny that you earn through your actions and behavior. So if you see, if I think I have to be poor because of something I've done in the past, even a bad decision, if I think that I deserve to be sick because of something, then I think I've got karma coming to me. But Jesus broke karma. Jesus got what he didn't deserve so I can get what I don't deserve. Let me read to you in uh, Isaiah. It says in Isaiah 53, verses four and five, we thought his troubles, Jesus' troubles, were a punishment from God, a puni punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, he crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. So you see, Jesus, we thought, the people then esteemed him stricken by God and afflicted as if he had done something wrong. Well, he must have deserved this, but he didn't. And so he changed it forever. Jesus broke karma. Now you may not say in your mind, oh, I believe in karma, but it is a subtle thing. Um, you know, sometimes, sometimes when we come to Jesus Christ, he may say, we may need to make restitution. 
But that is not the criteria for being saved. The Word says that we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth, not our sins, we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and we are saved. By faith, we believe that the work is done as God points out in His Word. And so we receive that. But sometimes we believe things that they're, they're subtle and, and we're being very religious. And unfortunately, a lot of churches preach it religiosity, not what the Word says. When Jesus was dying on the cross and the thieves were on either side of him, the one thief believed in him. He was a thief. And he cried out to Jesus and Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. He didn't say you need to go pay back everybody you, you've done wrong you, or you've wronged. But he said, today you will be with me in paradise. So sometimes the Lord may convict you. In the story of Nicodemus, when Jesus went to his house, uh, Nicodemus was uh, overwhelmed with Jesus. And he said, if I've taken from anybody, I'm going to give back fourfold. So sometimes our heart is moved within us to do that. But that's not the basis of my salvation. My salvation is based upon me believing and receiving what Jesus Christ has done for me. Let's look at um, the story of um, Saul, Paul. That when he was on the um, road to Damascus, Saul was, um, he was a piece of work. I mean, he was a Jew's Jew, a Pharisee's Pharisee. He knew the law, and he wasn't going to put up with all these people that were in the way, that were following Christ. And he was responsible for jailing Christians. He was he may not have personally killed somebody with his own hands, but he certainly was complicit in people being jailed and probably put to death. In fact, um, in in the book of Acts, we see where he they laid their coats at the feet of, of Saul while they stoned Stephen. So he thought, you know, that what was going on was a right thing. So he may have not been throwing stones, but he was there nonetheless. And so we see what God did in Saul's life. He stopped him on the road to Damascus. There was a bright light and he heard the voice of God. And when he opened his eyes, he was blinded for three days. And God told him to go to, uh, down to the road straight and to, to um, stay in a house there. And then God began to speak to a Christian by the name of Ananias. And God told him to go down and pray for Saul that he could receive his sight because there were many things that, that uh, Saul was going to do for God. Ananias did not want to go. He knew Saul's reputation and he was afraid. What, when he opens his eyes, what's going to happen? I'm right there, he's going to see me, he's going to grab me and throw me in jail and have me killed, whatever. But he was obedient to, to God. And so this is what God told Saul through Ananias. He said um, to Ananias when he was arguing, he said, go for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul, we know that Saul's name was changed to Paul. And God is, is saying he's a chosen vessel. He's going to suffer things for my name. But it didn't say he's going to suffer because he killed Christians. He's going to suffer because he came against the um, people that were following Christ. That's what not, that is not what God said. He said he's a chosen vessel that is going to represent me. So um, God never told Saul or Paul that he was going to suffer things for the bad that he had done, not, at, not even after all the havoc that he had created, but he was a chosen vessel. He was going to suffer for the name of Jesus, not for his sins, because Jesus suffered, died, and rose again for the sins of Paul, not Paul. That was not Paul's job. This was worked so deeply in Paul that in Acts chapter 20, verse 26, he said, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, Acts 20, 26. And then in Acts chapter 28, we have the story of Paul's shipwreck, where they all uh, landed up on this island uh, from this boat that had uh, been crushed on the shore uh, by the storm. And so, but everyone made it to shore. And so they were gathering um, 
uh, firewood. And so as Paul reached down and gathered firewood, uh, a, a viper or snake uh, attached itself to his arm and then he, fling, he flung it off. And the people there waited to see him swell up because they said, oh, he must be a murderer. He must have done something. Let's read this in uh, Acts chapter 28, verses three through six. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said one to another, no doubt this man is a murderer whom though he had escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow to live, karma. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long time and so saw no harm had come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. So they were expecting karma. He, was, he must be some murderer that this snake did. So uh, he's gonna swell up and die. And then when that didn't happen, he's, he's a god. He didn't suffer any ill effects, so he's a god. So here's the idea, do good, get good, do bad, get bad. What they believed was true in this sense. Paul had been a murderer. He was responsible for the death of many people, but Paul was not receiving that. He knew that he had been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and his past had been washed clean as if it had never happened. It did, but that's the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus Christ. He makes it as if it had never happened. Uh, you may be going through some difficult cult times. You may have done things in the past and the enemy's beating you over the head saying, you need to pay for this. You need to do this. This is going to come against you. You've got to suffer. You've got to pay your dues. You've got to, you know, the old adage, you made your bed. Now you've got to sleep in it. Folks, Jesus Christ came to change that. He came to wash that clean. He came to make us whole. And the things that might, be, might have come our way because of sin, that might have been coming toward us because uh, we deserved something, He stopped it. And He covered us with His blood so that the consequences were there. Oh my gosh, is that wonderful? It is absolutely phenomenal. Now, am I saying that there aren't consequences and we can just go out and be willy-nilly? Of course not, but I'm saying that Jesus has done for us and we need to believe what Jesus has done and receive the revelation of the um, overwhelming, shaking your head, can understand it. I don't deserve it. How could he? Revelation that Jesus Christ did for you and me. He took the condemnation and the judgment that should have been upon us and received it to himself so that we could be free. It's amazing. This is good news. First, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things. How many? All things have become new. All things have become new. Jesus Christ has done that for you and me. I am not my Savior. I am not the one that saves me. I am not the one that pays the price because Jesus Christ paid the price for me. He took the judgment. He took the punishment so I could have what he should have, which is favor, mercy, grace, forgiveness. It's all what Jesus Christ has done for us. Truly, the gospel is good news. So as we get ready to enter a new year, and if you're making lists of things you're not going to do anymore and things you're going to change, and th that's okay. There's no problem with that. But I want you to know that there is power in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ has done for us, that he will empower us to change. He will empower us to repent and walk away from things that have been deep-seated in us. Truly, the gospel is good news.
Now that is a reason for a happy new year. God bless you.